Hello, and welcome to the 411 Ground and Pound MMA podcast, your weekly look into the wide, wacky, wonderful world of mixed martial arts. I'm Robert Winfrey, your host for this particular show. Uh, before we get into anything else, let me do some of the housekeeping. Thank you, first of all, for listening more than anything. Uh, if you could interact with this just a little bit, whatever your platform of choice is to view these things, to listen to them, if you could subscribe, if you could give a review, if you could give a thumbs up, if that's relevant, anything that you can, anything that helps, it all helps the algorithm. And the algorithm basically rules our lives. We are at its mercy and we all know it. So if you could help us out a little bit with that and share, please share. Tell a friend, tell an enemy, tell a stranger. That covers all your possible interactions with other human beings. Tell one of each uh, if you think they'd be interested. That would help a great deal. Thank you all in advance. Get that out of the way. All right, on the agenda this evening, last night, UFC 263, which uh, hmm, was a good card on paper, a mostly good card in execution, does not seem to have trended as well as we all kind of thought. Um, just random factoid, not a single piece of UFC 263 related uh, material on YouTube was in the trending videos. Now, that's somewhat skewed because there was that stupid uh, TikTokers versus YouTubers boxing event. God help us all. But it, it, I don't know, it, it's a little bit odd. It just didn't, doesn't quite seem to have hit the way you might have anticipated. Now, that might not be true when it comes to buys. It might have done very well buy rate, but just didn't uh, draw a lot of chatter. Entirely possible. But Dave yeah. Meltzer reported USC was the biggest thing over the weekend with 2.65 million searches. On Google. Uh, that helps. That definitely helps it. Uh, the UFC search traffic is always an interesting thing to look at. Uh, that voice you heard, ladies and gentlemen, returning for the first time in a little bit because he's a busy man. And, well, you know, scheduling, interests, sometimes the UFC schedule gets to everybody. But Jeffrey Harris, the 411 jack of all trades, is back with us. Jeff, it is nice to have you back. How are you? Thank you for having me back on, Robert. I'm sorry. It's been a while, um, you know. You've been faithfully carrying the torch for this show, and you've been doing such a great job, and I, I graciously accept the opportunity to come back on. So thank you. You are always welcome. You know that. So we have a look at UFC 263. This coming week, the UFC will be on ESPN for UFC on ESPN 25, which has a really good main event between Dan Ige and Chan Sung Jung. The rest of the card... Maybe it was mostly in the MMA bubble, but I saw plenty of Twitter chatter last night for UFC. And again, it apparently did it, a, a high search count on Google. For the I weekend. think I think anyone you this was the kind of event that would draw out a big portion of the casual fan base. But uh, again, and YouTube might be in this particular case, again, specifically more skewed because of their event. But uh, it. Uh, it, it's just a little surprising. YouTube, the YouTube numbers for the UFC stuff are usually fairly strong, and they've, okay. been, they've been reduced for this. Well, weekend. most of I, them. Again, how that translates, we'll have to wait. Well, you have, but you have ESPN Plus and all that, and things, well, and everything. Well, it, you've still got the clips that all should do fairly well. You've also here's got all my, the. Right, here's my point. Every media is so segmented now. It's it's sourced from so many different platforms. You know. Yeah, that's true. Uh, we've also got a few bits and pieces of news from the weekend, such as it was. Uh, Bellator has a new welterweight champion in Yaroslav Amosov, who is a... I know people weren't very high on that fight, but boy, did he put a... That man's a problem. That man's a real problem. Uh, Clarissa Shields won her MMA debut, so maybe that. And then... Last weekend, I talked about it. I delayed recording the show to talk about it because they ran about the same time. But the Floyd Mayweather and Logan Paul pay-per-view apparently did some pretty good numbers. So I might talk about that and then anything, of course, that breaks between now and then. And then we'll get into plugs and get out of here. So with that in mind, let's jump into UFC 263. It was a good show. All round. Yeah. Yeah, let's start with the main event, because why not? In your main event... Middleweight champion Israel Adesanya defeats Marvin Vittori via unanimous decision, 50-45 across all three scorecards. A uh, little bit, 
I have it full. I need to watch this again in order to fully formulate my thoughts on both guys. I, I have my base thoughts, of course. But Jeff, you had some fairly concerted opinions about uh, how this fight went on the part of the Italian Dream. So wh- why don't you get? The, why, why don't I give you the? Why don't I give you the floor first? It wasn't a very smart performance by Marvin Vittori. He he seemed too fixated on the wrestling and the takedowns. Adesanya had the wrestling and takedowns well scouted. He did get a couple takedowns, but he was never able to keep uh, Adesanya on his back for a significant length of time or do any meaningful work on the ground at all. Uh, I don't really think, I think his cardio game was okay. He did, I don't, because he managed to keep up for five rounds, but his output was a real problem. He had the center of the octagon for most of the fight. He even had Adesanya on his heels uh, early on, but he wasn't able to just uh, put the combinations together uh, to put the output, the volume together. And Adesanya was able to just pick him apart for the rest of the fight with better combinations, uh, better leg kicks. Um, his ki- you know, his kicking game was Those on were- point last night. Those were nasty leg kicks, man. They, yeah. He ha- and and they were doing clear damage to Vittori in in the latter half of the fight, in the championship rounds, because they were they were clearly doing damage. And I think he even got a knock. He got a solid knockdown with uh, some of those leg yeah. kicks. So I believe in the fourth he did. Yeah. But but you know when you're when you're in in the fifth round of a UFC title fight and you're still just pushing your opponent up against the fence and not really. Uh, effectively trying to transition to a takedown or really, you know, there's things you can even do up against the fence in the clinch if you have your opponent there. And I didn't really see it from him. And I, it, it just seemed like a very low IQ, half-hearted performance from Marvin Vittori. I was also disappointed with Jason Herzog because we had a lot of these just, you know, boring stalemates up against the fence where just nothing was happening and then it looked like it looked like Adesanya was getting frustrated with him. He was even slapping Vittorio on the ass, just like, okay, you're at just the, gonna at the end of the fourth. Yeah, hold um, me was against. Her, was Herzog yeah. the ref for this? Or was it Mark Goddard? It was. It was um, one of those two. I can't remember which. Pretty sure it was Herzog. Okay. One is. Did I mix them up? No, no, it was Mark Goddard. I'm sorry. Okay. I mean, the complaint is valid either way. It was more, I, I, I don't know why I got those two mixed up. They have very similar haircuts. Okay, so it was Mark Goddard. It looked like he, it looked like Adesanya was even arguing with Mark Goddard uh, last night. So, whatever. Uh, it was a, it wasn't, I think it was a, a strong performance by Adesanya. It was... Um, he, he, look, Vittori was a tough opponent, a dangerous opponent. Uh, I just think Vittori did not have a good game plan and he wasn't able, he wasn't able to make good adjustments. And then I think he wasn't able to take opportunities that Adesanya was even offering in that fight. So that's why I was disappointed with Vittori. So all culminated in uh, a victory and another title defense for Israel Adesanya against a guy who had beaten before, but it was a split decision, but this was a five round title fight. So it was, it was a dominant emphatic victory. Yeah. There, there's no, there's no way to give Vittori even a single round of this fight. There, there just isn't. Uh, he had the one moment in round three. I think when he got not only, he not only got a takedown, but he got Adesanya's back. And got fairly close to a choke attempt, but Adesanya was able to uh, bridge out and spin into him. That that was kind of the last gasp of Vittori's meaningful offense as far as the fight went. Uh, Vittori, I think, is in a rough spot because not only was this a very poor performance relative to Adesanya, this is just kind of how Vittori fights. He's a uh, come forward, get in your face throw punches, get physical contact, uh, kind of grind you out style of fighter. And he's going to beat the majority of the middleweight division that way. I mean, in fact, he has. He was on a five-fight winning streak coming into this. 
He's 72 overall. Yeah, he the man is a winning fighter in the UFC. And he had with a couple of fairly I mean his win over Jack Hermanson was uh fairly impressive considering how again it was a lot of this, but doing that to Jack Hermanson is not easy. Uh the problem is this this style any mono direct any like single directional style is going to be a is going to be fairly easy for someone like Adesanya to pick apart. And Adesanya is he's a very slippery counter striker. He's dynamic. Um and he's not like an aggressive he's not going to like come forward and do what Vittori wants him to do. It's really hard to make him do that. And it's not impossible. It, it's actually why Jan Blahovich was so successful. First of all, Blahovich packs enough power in his punches to make you respect them. So you, you can't... There's certain things that you do against a guy whose punches are unlikely to put you out versus a guy whose punches are very likely to put you out. But you... Which, again, changes the whole dynamic. But Vittori... But Vittori is always coming forward. Blahovich would go forward, and then he'd go back, and then he'd respond to a feint with a little bit of forward, and then back up, and then as Adesanya came forward, that's when he'd close space and go for a double leg. And that dance is hard. That dance is very hard to pull off, especially against someone as talented as Adesanya. It's a very, very difficult thing to do. And Vittori didn't have the power to make Adesanya have to respect his punches that same way and he doesn't quite have the overall wherewithal to set that kind of a trap and it's this make that makes this a very very difficult fight for him under the best of circumstances so he's in a position where i would favor him over a lot of the middleweight division uh but i i don't think i'd ever favor him over either whitaker or adesanya Nonetheless, uh, it was a great performance for Adesanya coming off the, the fight with Blahovic to re-legitimize himself as, as, as the middleweight champion and re-cement his title reign. This was his third title defense as middleweight champion, and he's going to have all the momentum going in against uh, Robert Whitaker for their rematch, provided that rematch happens, because, it's, I mean, look at it's certainly the fight to make. Now that doesn't right. mean things won't happen, but that's the fight to make. Right. Um, but he beat him by knockout the first time. That fight was. Have you rewatched that fight at all? N- not recently. It was that a fight, good fight, though. That fight is not as close as it appeared on first viewing. <laughs> I re- I've rewatched it a couple of times. I think uh, I think Whitaker did okay in the first round, though. Uh, but it was only, I look, thought it was, so only too. It, it was less than, it was less than two rounds. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I thought Whitaker did fine in the first round. And then again, I watched it a second time and boy, did he not connect anywhere near as much as I thought he but did. But here's my issue. Like Whitaker has looked good since that fight. He's picked up three strong wins. Yeah. But he beat, what, what is it? Till Gastelum. Tip and, and Cannoneer. Who's in Cannoneer. Cannoneer has. Turned nope. into, he was a he was a good competitor going into that fight. A very tough competitor. Well, it, was un, it was unbeaten at middleweight, I seem to recall. Right. right. So in Gastelum, I mean, any day of the week, Gastelum is a very tough, durable opponent. I have yeah. not seen anything from Whitaker yet that's convinced me or made me believe he he he's capable of beating Adesanya in their rematch in any of those three three fights. I'm not saying I, he can't. I haven't seen yeah. anything that makes me believe he can. Uh, I understand. My takeaway from that potential rematch is just kind of the following. I don't think it will go like their first fight. I, I think right. I think Whitaker was uh, very amped up in that first fight. The, uh, the way he fought was a little bit atypical. He's not usually that aggressive. Uh, so I, I think it, I don't think it'll look the same way, but I do think that Adesanya probably wins. Adesanya did a, uh, it was either a Twitch stream or, or something he released as a YouTube video. Right. That was him talking through his, for his first fight with Whitaker. And which I've, 
I found very interesting, but he said one thing in particular that made me, that kind of made me, gave me some pause and made me re-examine Whitaker. Whitaker's not a terribly strong pocket fighter. And valid. I think that's probably, again, it's not that he doesn't have enough power to hurt you from there. He does, but he's not a big pocket exchange guy. He likes to either keep you all the way at the end of what he's doing with his jab, which is he might have the best jab in MMA. He's certainly one of them, if not the best. And he's got good combos. Good wrestling, good takedowns, good grappling. But he likes to be, again, at the end of his range or blitzing through you. He's not a he's not a gunslinger in the in that, you know, let's get in the pocket in exchange. That's I not think really... he's more of a volume fighter. Yeah. And, and it was just an observation about the spacing that he likes to operate in that I hadn't fully considered. And Adesanya doesn't mind a gunfight. He doesn't do it if he thinks it's disadvantageous. But he. You know, that finish of Paulo Costa, for example, he had kind of, you know, he had battered Costa, but then Costa got close into the pocket and Costa is a very good end fighter. But that's the space when Adesanya clipped him and finished him. And it's so I again, I just think that's a bit of a spatial problem for Whitaker to navigate. I I look forward to their rematch. Blahovic fight wasn't really much of a gunfight anyway. No, that was that was three rounds of. War of attrition, kind of. Three rounds of jousting, almost like yeah, back up yeah. and back up, and then clash and back up and back up, you know, like uh, you know, dance and clash, dance and clash, and then the final two rounds of Blahovic being able to get takedowns and just smothering top control. Well, one thing I do want to credit uh, Adesanya in his camp, you know, I want to say like 10, 13 years ago, and even after that. You know, whenever we'd see, you know, a kickboxer or a striker get in there, very often we'd see the kickboxer and striker, it was just very easy to just take those guys down and lay on them or grind on them. And then they, they'd look like a fish out of water. They, they'd flop around and they didn't know guys who didn't know what to do when they're on their back. Like they could, they were good enough that their striking and their stopping power would get them to a certain level but once they got to that kind of top five area or contender area, they couldn't use um, use those striking skills or kickboxing to get them the rest of the way to the title level. Um, you know, with some exceptions. But now, we, you know, we have a guy like Adesanya, who's primarily comes from a kickboxing background, who trains with wrestling and trains with takedowns enough so where if he gets put on his back, He's able, you know, he doesn't get discouraged and look like an idiot. And he's able to get back to his feet and keep the fight where he needs it to be to score points and win. And I'm glad we've we've seen the evolution of the game where a kickboxer or a striker is no longer powerless and helpless on the ground where maybe they're not going to, you know, be pulling guard and going for submissions, but they can work with getting put on their back or they can work with guys shooting for takedowns, uh, constantly going for takedowns. And that is one of my favorite parts. That's one of my favorite parts of Adesanya's game is he does not look like a dumb idiot um, when he's challenged by wrestling and takedowns, you know? Um, uh, against who was the, the fence, other guy? His takedown defense, his takedown defense against yeah. the fence in particular is almost lights out. It is who's really the, hard to get him who's down. The guy, who's the guy who – not Paul F- – who's the uh, – is it Paul Daly? Yeah, uh, Paul Daly. Paul Daly, like a really good striker kickboxer, mm-hmm. but just couldn't deal with takedowns and wrestling, you know? And um, Nate, Diaz, Nate Diaz is a lot like that, too. Uh, yeah, both the Diaz brothers to varying degrees. Can't deal with wrestling or, or takedowns. And, you know, despite being good BJJ specialists, they're not very good, especially good off their back. Unless uh, we're fighting Takanori Gomi. Uh, so, yeah, Adesanya versus Whitaker seems to be the fight to make. Uh, Whitaker's very clear to the number one contender, has done enough to earn a rematch. Uh, Adesanya said he wants the fight to be in Auckland, New Zealand. Their previous one was in Melbourne. I think he indicated October. 
Uh, some new, some other soundbite about a more specific date from Adesanya's uh, desire came in. I think it was again kind of fallish, so October, uh, September. I'm fine with that if they can work out the logistics. Go for it. Uh, it's a, it's a good fight. It's probably the two best middleweights in the world. Uh, I'm down, is, I'm, is New Zealand lo- logistically possible for later this year? I don't know. Again, that, that's one of those things. It's kind of pending that, but uh, I don't know what I, I know for a while. New Zealand had the, you know, 14 day quarantine for anyone coming into the country. I don't know if that's still a thing or not. It might be. It might not be, given how vac- given how, you know, COVID uh, treatment and vaccinations have been going out. So now I, I heard well, I heard New Zealand. They, you know, they handled the quarantine better than most other countries during this whole disaster. Um, but, uh, what is their vaccination rate? I have no idea. Let's uh, see. Again, you're dealing with a smaller country, so probably fairly high. Like when I last checked, when I last checked Japan, it was terrible compared to the there population are, rate. There are places that are having some problems. I mean, the United States is doing okay with it. Uh, Mexico's kind of a... Mexico's having real problems. Uh, Australia seems to be doing okay. But uh, I, I don't know specifically about New Zealand. That's... Uh, again, I, okay, that's so New Zealand that New Zealand has, a, has an 8% vaccination rate. Which isn't... That's not great. Not very great. But, like, Japan's was terrible compared to how many doses they actually had. Mm. Like, they were just sitting on doses. Which... It's weird to me, you know, countries that kind of handled this so well, you know, at the start, like Japan, falling behind so terribly now. Sad, but whatever. Well, again, it, some of that might be issues of how much faith does the individual population have in the specific uh, compound they've been provided. I mean, well, I'm... Oh God, I... I'm going to say the following, and I want you all to understand. I'm not telling you not to get a COVID shot. I haven't had mine yet, but that's... I uh, had mine. I, I certainly plan on it, but the CDC had a emergency meeting because apparently the Pfizer COVID shot had gave it in, uh, provided a, an increased risk of, um, like, my, what is it, myo, uh, cardiomyopathy, my, myto, something like that, some heart problem. Is that is that proven or is that just suspect? I don't again. I don't. Caution. I know their meeting is proven. Now again, co- uh, uh, coincidence does not prove causation. So I, again, I don't know specifically. I just the like J and J, like the J and J vaccine or, or the Johnson and Johnson vaccine had that issue a while back where they with blood clotting. Yeah. Yeah, but that was a precaution. They didn't have. They didn't have direct evidence that it was causing blood clots, but they were they did it as a precaution because people who had had it were having a blood clot issue. Yeah, I so again, I don't know for sure where it falls on okay. that particular okay. side of okay, things. Okay, okay, fair I, enough. And again, I'm not I'm not saying don't I'm not I'm not trying to fear monger. I'm not saying don't get the right, right. COVID shot. I'm I I'm saying if we want to look at why large populations might have cause for might might be hesitant. Uh, there's re, especially almost kind of crazily, especially if they handled it well, uh, they might not see the same kind of necessity for uh, for yeah. whatever value the shots uh, contain. There, there Whereas, are definitely cultural there are definitely cultural things about uh, vaccinations in other countries. It's not 100%. just. It's not just in the U.S., believe it or not, as crazy as it's gotten over here. Um, yeah, but I, uh, yeah, I know, I, I know, I, I know. I, I'm trying not to get on the soapbox because yeah, but basically, it would be interesting if they could get New Zealand for that fight. But yeah. I, I, you know, look, it's a different world there's, right now. There, there's legit. Well, not only are the, not only is it a different world. Trying to unwind all the stuff that was put in place during the pandemic. I mean, the pandemic's not done, but you know, all the precautions and all these safety protocols and whatnot that companies and governments and whatnot put into place 
walking those back is going to be a slower process than I think most than most people are prepared to accept. So if they can do it, great. I would love to see it. Uh, if, but again, the logistics have to kind of work out, and you know, the UFC is going to be the ones that are going to look into all the details about that. They're the ones who would have to figure out how to make it work. But so anyway, that was your main event. Adesanya still undefeated at middleweight, still the champion. Okay, according to CNN Travel, New Zealand has the toughest travel guidelines of any place in the world since right. March okay. 2020. Now yeah, this was they had that, they had that this was as of June 2021. So they, they probably have not relaxed too much on their restrictions. And and you know what? I can't really blame them. Hey, look, if if a pandemic hits and you're in a place that has the resources and the and it is logistically feasible to essentially shut down your borders like that, good. You know, you I, I I'm not I, I'm not here to criticize large scale policy. The US on probably how- should have done it earlier. I certainly would have supported it uh, for whatever my take is worth on that. But Mm -hmm. anyway, so that's your main event. Good fight. We'll shoot. Not great, but good. Crow main event. Jeff, you just brought up something. You brought up an interesting point about, you know, the state of MMA, you know, 12 years ago, give or take. Right. If you could go back in time to you know you you to the MMA community 12 years ago and tell them that for a UFC title a Mexican fighter born in Mexico trained not exclusively but primarily in Mexico would beat a Brazilian for the for a UFC title you'd have been laughed out of the room that that was that was just not a Cain Velasquez that, he was born in Cain's born in uh oh. Yeah, Arizona. technically not born in Mexico. Ah. Also, look here's the relevant here's the really relevant thing about even that. The, Kane even never. Kane is Mexican. Uh, Mexican he claims American. Mex- he has Mexican heritage. I don't just I don't uh I don't you know begrudge him that. He also doesn't train there or live there. Right. Okay. Fair Brandon enough. Moreno, Brandon Moreno, born I believe in Tijuana, lives in Tijuana, <laughs> trains mostly in that area. That that a again that a Mexican MMA fighter could beat a Brazilian for the UFC title 10, 12 years ago was a laughable notion given where the sport was at that time. Okay, there was one. There was not ten years, like eight or nine years ago. There was a promising Mexican uh, prospect. You uh, get one or uh, you would uh, get one or yeah. two every now and then. I'm blanking but, on his name now, but I'm trying to figure. I'm trying to remember. You thinking of, I, are you thinking of Goyito? Uh, Perez. Eric Perez. Here we yeah. go. Yeah. Eric Perez, yeah. good fighter, had a promising start. Um, kind of washed out. Born in Mexico. Born in Mexico. Yeah, he's kind of washed out. Uh, he's fighting in Bellator now, though. Um, yeah, did kind of wash out. What I, I said what I said. Oh. Uh, he trained at he trained at Jackson Wink for a while, didn't he? Uh, I think so. I don't, I don't know if he still does or not. But did he did move for a to while. he did, he 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 was in San Diego. I think he's in San Diego now. But okay. um, he was a guy like at, for a while. I thought okay, this guy could be he could be a promising prospect for the bantamweight division. He and um. He had the whole luchador mask thing. He he seemed to be on his way, but he just couldn't. Um, once he got to that uh, those upper level fights, you know, he was losing to the likes of Mizugaki, Brian Caraway. Um, this is a, he won his he he ended his UFC career on a winning streak, and then I guess they released him. So that or just cool. didn't sign him to another deal. Yeah. So I guess I guess. They didn't see they didn't see him as much of a prospect, uh, but you know Moreno, you know, was kind of in a similar boat, dude. Yeah, I'm not a I'm not a huge Moreno fan necessarily. Well, yeah, you're right. I never would have foreseen. I never yeah. would have foreseen or predicted this. And if I did, people probably would have laughed me out of the room. But yeah, your yeah. your your premise is correct. Brazil was a powerhouse of producing top tier MMA talent, and still and still does. Mexico. Yeah, now we have a, Charles. Now we have Charles Oliveira. Uh, 
yeah, I mean, you've got, I mean, some, you've got some aging guys, you've got some up and coming ones. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of talent that comes out of Brazil in the MMA world. And Mexico was not an MMA hotbed by any stretch of the imagination. Now, because of, because not just of the way the sport grows, but the dedication of the talent, you've got one. It's, again, this is the first Mexican born UFC champion. Still in his twenties, so he still has a, a still has a lot of room to grow, arguably. So it's exciting. And not not only that, but the performance. This was their first fight. Was the first fight between these two was great. It was one of the be- one of the five best fights of 2020. This fight, uh, Moreno came out and just from the get go was on fire, moving well, fighting up and down combinations not afraid of Figueredo and Figueredo I think partially because of how much he has to cut to make flyweight yep he's had these types of performances that are a little bit lifeless that are a little bit uh I mean even in some fights he's won he's just been a little flat and this was not the fight to be flat in Moreno came out again house of fire bad day at the office for him yeah, uh, in you know third round, Figueredo has. This is true. Figueredo is not an easy guy to get down as a general rule, but if you start that process, he's got a bad habit of getting of giving his back. His only loss prior to this, Figueredo's, was against um, Formiga. Formiga, yeah, a little over two years ago. Formiga got that win largely by ducking under power punches. Starting body lock takedowns, and then as Figueredo tried to defend, he would give his back, and Formiga is a lights-out back taker. Uh, genuinely one of the best back takers that uh, the UFC's seen. Brandon Moreno, not quite the same level of back taker that Formiga is, but the same habit is still present, and he was able to capitalize. Uh, really, really phenomenal performance out of Moreno. Took uh, the long way, took the long way, made it happen. Re- Remember lowest? I didn't watch. I watched a bit of this season of the Ultimate Fighter because it was all the flyweight champions from around the world. Yep. I watched the fights. I didn't watch the episodes. But he was the lowest seed on that season. Got into the UFC. Got cut. Uh, came back and is now champion. Like uh, you lost know. to guys like Sergio Pettis, who was you know Sergio Pettis, kind of just like a a journeyman in two weight well, classes. Ser- Sergio Good Pettis fighter. now. Now yeah. the uh, the Bellator bantamweight champion. I rest my case. Yeah, the ba- I mean bantamweight's a deep enough division that there's proof, talented proof fighters. Of the pu- in proof of the pudding, is it not? Okay, there's a couple of d- Bellator has three, I think three to four top end fighters. I'm not sure. I, yeah. I don't mean to. Dis- I don't mean to. Dis- fighters, dis- there are good fighters in Bellator, but to me, look, look, Pettis was in the UFC for a while. He competed in two weight classes. Was a solid, was a solid, decent fighter. Was mm-hmm. never, was never a world beater. Leaves the UFC, goes, becomes a bigger fish in a smaller pond, and now he's a champion. You know? Yeah. And yeah, so we've got, uh, we've got Moreno on top here. Uh, yeah, and it's impossible to feel, to not feel good for that man. You know, everything he's, the, the ups and downs, fighting to a, getting a title shot on three weeks' notice. Because the UFC was desperate to save that last card, and Figueredo agreeing to it, fighting with everything he had, getting a draw, you know, it's kind of funny. But if that, if there's not that point deduction to Moreno in that fight, uh, the, the Figueredo, Figueredo has the point deduction. If there's not that point deduction in their first fight, Figueredo wins that fight clearly. It's still a great fight, but do you get an immediate rematch after Figueredo pretty clearly wins three rounds to two Probably from Moreno? Not. Probably not. It goes to show you guys, be mindful of your weapons. If Figueredo, I don't know what would have happened. Uh, again, they might have done they might have done the rematch anyway. They might have. But uh, yeah, small things, man. Small things make a difference. And, so and, and you know, I'm very happy happy for Moreno. He's a great family man. He's a great spokesperson for the sport. You know, if you didn't feel at least a little something watching him sob while holding his uh, yeah. 
not infant, but like toddler child with his family around like, him. This like this was a guy I felt so happy for him because he just seems like a nice, humble guy, a family man, cares for his family so much. His his little girls were there. I was so happy for him. I was really worried feel- for him. I'm almost going to feel bad when he loses that belt in his first title defense. Uh, to ask, which I, I don't know. I like that. That's a quasi facetious comment from me because whether they do an immediate rematch for Figueredo, which, Oh, I don't know that they will, but they might. And look, like I said, Figueredo looked a little listless here, but would you be surprised if he came back like a house on fire and stopped Moreno in a third fight between the two of them? I mean, I wouldn't. Uh, Figueredo? Yeah. If, I if would because be, I don't think, I don't think Figueredo can handle that weight cut anymore. It's a real question for him, man. That dude is shredded to make one. It was a problem for him when he, from, from when he was first became champion. And when he first fought for the title, was supposed to first fight for the title. He couldn't even make weight. Yeah. It's been a recurring problem for him. And, and, and I say that because he struggled to make weight on Friday before this fight. He just barely made weight. Well, he just barely made the time window. <laughs> That's what I. Uh, he, yeah, uh, he he made 125. Fair. Uh, yes, but, he did. Yeah, it's. But just barely. It's a, it's a serious question uh, that he's going to have to kind of figure out whether that means uh, a slightly different lifestyle or a move up to ban. I don't know how he would do at bantamweight. I really don't. I, um, unless you're. He's, he's, and, and look, unless you're really starving for title fights right now, which maybe. Maybe UFC is. I don't think you have to do an immediate rematch or turn these guys right around right away. Uh, if Figueredo doesn't get the next title shot, you, know, you mentioned uh, Askar Askarov, who I think would be the next contender. Uh, or does he have a fight coming up? Uh, I'm checking right now. He might have a fight coming up with Joseph Benavidez. Either that or they already fought and he won. He, he beat Joseph two. Benavidez yeah. at uh, 259. So he just fought three months ago. So I don't think he has a fight lined up right now. So the timing would line up. And Askarov and Moreno fought to a draw a couple of years ago. A uh, fight that, frankly, I kind of thought Askarov should have so won. So uh, there's some gas in that tank there. Yeah. The, flyweight's not a deep division the way the UFC gutted it. But there's... There are still some interesting. Right. And, um, and Moreno yeah. was one of the guys. I think he was one of those casualties when they were gutting yeah. the division, right? He was. Yeah. Uh, um, God. Uh, UFC, so make, good. Make, Kyo- make Kyoji Horiguchi an offer. Let him come back and win the belt because I think he would. <laughs> I mean, considering I thought they were just going to jettison the division again after. They were. <laughs> after. Uh, after, after that. After yeah. Cejudo. After Cejudo got it. And then went went up to Bantamweight, I thought, okay, that's it. Certainly after Fig- certainly after Figueredo and Benavidez the first time. When, when but I guess, I, guess this, weight. I guess this pandemic just necessitate yeah, and, and then uh, Figueredo missed weight for their title fight. I'm like, God, and then, like, and, then, and then smashed Benavidez to win the fight. But I assume I guess the pandemic necessitates we need every champion, every title we can muster. Even the lesser ones. So there you go. I'm looking forward to Askarov and Moreno. I, I'm i not saying I'm going to pick Askarov. I'd have to do a little bit more concerted tape study on the two of them. But don't be surprised if that deaf Russian beats Moreno. Askarov, does look, he does look like a dangerous matchup. But uh, he's a, it's a good, ma- it's that good man matchup. Is a, that man is a smothering force. He's and undefeated. Like wrestling- he's, he's undefeated. And he, I mean, he is only... Three and one in uh, three three and one draw in the UFC, but he is undefeated. And he's and he's looked really good in some of those wins. Again, the Benavidez win in particular, uh, not uh, he outstruck and out wrestled Benavidez. And I, I know Benavidez isn't who he used to be, but that's still a heck of a thing. Uh, so anyway, that was your co-main event. I I don't know exactly again if they wanted to. I'd be a little surprised if we got an immediate rematch between these two, but depending on who's available and whatever logistics pan out, we might. I certainly wouldn't. I wouldn't complain too loudly. Uh, again, that's somewhat dependent on uh, who's available, what travel restrictions are in place, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 
Uh, we had another five-round fight, the first ever non-title fight, non-main event, five-round affair in UFC history, wherein Leon Edwards defeated Nate Diaz via unanimous decision, 49-46 on all three scorecards. I, I, I have to say this, and I have to phrase this the following way. This fight was 24 minutes of Leon Edwards beating the crap out of Nate Diaz. And then 60 seconds of Nate Diaz landing one good straight left hand, badly hurting Leon Edwards, and miraculously, from the jaws of not just defeat, but humiliating defeat, at least preserving the Diaz brand. I mean, if Diaz were... Let me be very clear about what I'm about to say. When I say in better shape, I don't mean that his cardio failed him. It didn't. I don't mean that he didn't come in shape to fight. He did. His leg was chewed to pieces. So when I say if he'd been in better, if he had been in that fight, in that moment, in a better position relative to his own physicality and what had taken place over the previous 24 minutes, he might have been able to finish that fight. That's crazy. That's how crazy that was at that moment in time. Uh, the most of this for again, 24 minutes. This was every Leon Edwards fight you've ever seen. He's got power. He's good up and down with his kicks and his punches. Good shot selection. Doesn't make a lot of mistakes. Great about finding moderate positions of control, finding ways to land damage and then disengage safely. All of which is very, very difficult to do. And he does them very well. And then one minute of insanity. Um, Post-fight, Edwards said he's looking forward to his title shot. Uh, That poor man's going to get screwed because he should be fighting for the belt. But uh, the UFC's matchmaking policy in some cases is what it is. Jeff, that last minute was utter insanity. Nate Diaz is a barroom brawler. He's a sloppy fighter. He's beatable. He's always been beatable. He has 13... He's 20 and 13. Mm-hmm. He's... And and I... All those... Let's see. Eight losses in the UFC. And... Leon Edwards fought a smarter fight against Nate Diaz than Conor McGregor ever did. That's true. That is absolutely true. To beat Nate Diaz, you don't do what he wants you to do. You don't fall for his immature, taunting, and and garbage, sloppy barroom brawl tactics, which he was constantly trying to do. And constantly baiting Leon Edwards during the whole fight. Leon Edwards showed infinite composure, maturity, uh, and growth in that fight for not biting on the Diaz bait and not doing and not doing the stupid nonsense that Diaz wanted him to do. And he picked Diaz apart. Nate Diaz yep. won one minute of a twenty-five minute fight. I give and almost finished him in that minute. <laughs> and and yet he still and yet he couldn't. And yet cuz Diaz isn't good enough to finish a guy in the last minute cuz he's not. And Edward Edwards the 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 way people are trying to turn Nate Diaz into the hero of this fight disgusts me. Cuz Edwards is the guy who won that fight, not Nate Diaz. No, Edwards is the rightful winner. I again, I think he's not going to get the next title shot. I think the UFC's and it's Colby Covington. Yeah. Dana White said last night at the press conference. Yeah. Colby and Kamaru Usman was very dismissive of Edwards uh, in some comments after the fight as well. Uh, what Usman Kamaru is smart. Usman wants to make money. Usman wants a big payday. Edwards is not going to be the bigger. The, he wants the biggest payday possible. And that is Colby Covington. At that's the, why yeah. that's why he picked a rematch. That's why he picked a re, he rematch against that. He wants the easier fights, the easier fights that'll yield the highest return. Edwards I, on paper yeah. is the toughest matchup in the division for him right now. Oh no, no, 
Then who is it? Luke I, ge- No, no, no. Believe it or not, it's Covington. Really? I genuinely, yeah, 100%. Covington can keep Usman's pace. Who's Usman's toughest fight in the UFC? Who has it been thus far? Uh, I don't think it was, it, Co- honestly, I don't think it was, it was Covington. It was the Covington fight. You really think so? Yeah. Do, do you know what the scorecards were on that fight going into the fifth? I thought Usman had. I, I thought Usman was winning the fight. Ooh. One of those judges had it three rounds to one for Usman. One had it three rounds to one for Covington. One had it two apiece. Uh, that fight. That fight was by. It was pretty much by. But he hasn't by, fought. He hasn't fought Edwards yet. Who? Usman. Correct. Or, or has he fought? Has he fought Usman Edwards? Be, Usman's beaten Edwards. Yeah. Okay. Edwards about, has only lost Thompson, twice in the UFC. What about, Tom, what about Stephen Thompson and Luke? Um, Luke had a setback recently. Thompson is fighting Gilbert Burns. Okay. If Thompson, so if Thompson I'm, wins, but I mean, I mean, I mean, matchup what? How they match up against Usman? Thompson presents some unique challenges just because of how he fights. I, again, I, I just think the toughest fight for Kamaru is a guy who can keep his pace, which Covington can, a guy who can wrestle with him, which Covington can, and a guy who's willing to fight, who's willing to fight with him in the fire, and Covington is. Uh, look, Gilbert Burns think, had a moment of hope. I disagree. Here's why I disagree. All the right. first fight with Edwards was... Almost six years ago. Yeah, I, sure, it's been a while. And both those guys have tremendous. Both men have tremendously grown as fighters. Mm-hmm. And um, Edwards has not lost at all since that fight. And he's won one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. He's got a huge winning streak. He's nine and zero. Oh. He is nine and zero oh since that fight against Usman. Yeah. And, he, and again, and these are not in these and the guys he's had to fight are not pushovers. Luke is in the top five. Uh, Cerrone, when he fought Cerrone, Cerrone was was um, was Cerrone, He was erroneously ranked. All right. But but it's still Donald Cerrone. Garner Nelson was a tough opponent. Rafael Dos Anjos uh, and now Nate Diaz. Um, yeah, he, I. Again, you're just asking me how I think they match up and who's the tougher. Fight. I think I still think I I still think Edwards is a tougher matchup than Covington. I, of guys, of guys, Usman has faced before. I think read, Edwards is a tougher fight. My read on how their fight would go. Part of this part of this is what does Leon Edwards do well? He's technical. That's a that's a very vague answer, believe it or not. What does he do well? He is great. Car- he has car- He has cardio for days. He has faded in every fifth round he's ever been in. He fights at a very measured pace. He's very good about fighting at his measured pace. That's and that's a skill. Edwards does a couple of things really, really well. One, again, is kind of he controlling. Good kick. He has good. Ki- he's a good striker. He has good kicks. He's well rounded. He has. Yeah. He he is a very technical striker. Edwards primarily doesn't make is good about not making mistakes and he's good about finding a position that is a quarter better than yours and maintaining it to win rounds i mean that's the, those are valuable skills they absolutely are look at the winning streak he's on and like you said look at some of the names he's beaten that is yeah I, i'm not knocking the guy's skill set with what i'm about well, to what say. does covington uh, do well covington pushes a ridiculous pace transitions okay. between striking and wrestling Will overwhelm you with volume. Will overwhelm you with wrestling. But can't finish you. Neither, dude. Covington I guess has more than Woodley. Covington has more finishes than Edwards. I'm pretty sure. He be he finished Max Griffin and Woodley in his last fight. Okay. At, and look, at, and again, finishing is hard at the at the highest level. Uh. I think the big, the biggest thing, if you look at Edwards, he's what position is he ever going to be in to win minutes of a round against Kamaru Usman? 
Well, I would like to see and find out, honestly. I, I'm not. Let me be clear. I'm not objecting to that fight. I want to see it. Right. But but we're talking about hypothetical how I think these guys match up. Edwards is a good technical striker. Kamaru Usman is a very it, Kamaru Usman has become a very good striker, and Kamaru Usman hits much harder. Leon Edwards has a good clinch game about finding some position that he is again not. Massively better than you, but just enough better to hold it and score. Well, my he's not going to outclinch Kamaru Usman against re- rematches with Usman and Covington, Usman and Edwards. I'm still picking Covington. You mean uh, Usman? Thompson and Luke in the top five? I would still pick. Uh, I would still pick Usman. Oh yeah, look, I I pick Usman over the division. Look at what he's done his last three fights. I think is, Kiesa could give. I think Kiesa could give Usman some problems. I would still probably pick Usman. In that Kiesa part. in a prolonged grappling exchange. Yes. Would be interesting. Yes. I don't think he'd ever get there. <laughs> the, Maybe. Part of the reason. I, here, here's my interest in a rematch between Usman and Covington. It's primarily based around, believe it or not, one thing that I just want to know. No one has really tried to wrestle Kamaru Usman. I think in a rematch, Covington will, and I want to see how that goes. Okay, good point. Because Usman's been very honest and open about how bad his knees are. I don't know how he's going to hold up against a prolonged wrestling-based attack, and Covington has the pace and the style of wrestling to make that happen. Again, Edwards should have been the one getting the title shot instead of having to fight Nate, Nate Diaz here. 100%. He's earned that by every bit of merit. But but again, who do I think is the toughest fight for Usman on paper? I think, I think it's Covington. I may be wrong, but that's kind of my inclination right now. Um, Luke, I mean, God love him. He's a great fighter and he's an entertaining fighter, but he is... I don't think that fight goes well for him at all. Thompson might be able to win rounds against uh, against Usman. But I again, I, I would pick Usman fairly handily if we're talking about predictions. So, uh, but again, I pick Usman over that division, man. You could pick anybody and that somebody's going to beat him at some point. It's inevitable. But right now, there is no one. There is not a middleweight. Excuse me, there's not a welterweight that I am aware of in the world that I would pick to beat Kamaru Usman. Not a one. Uh, All right, so I don't know what Nate Diaz does next. He's still, I mean, that guy got the biggest pops out of that that crowd all night. He's still a beloved figure. I don't know if we try to do a... Uh, rematch with Masvidal. I don't know if he waits out to see if he can get the third fight with Connor, but that's kind of the space he's in. And Edwards is probably going to wind up waiting out for, he's probably going to wait for Usman and Covington, assuming that happens, and then try to lobby for the winner. But uh, this fight, unfortunately, did not do Edwards the kind of favors that you might have hoped for if you're a fan of the guys. All right, I don't have a whole lot to say about this next one. Bilal Muhammad defeats Damian Maya via unanimous decision, 229-28, 130-27. Probably Maya's last fight in the UFC. This was his last fight on his contract, and as a loss, he's probably done. Um, Muhammad was just able to stop all of his takedowns. Muhammad's balance, man. His balance in the single leg, especially against the fence, that was nuts. There were a few of those moments when I thought Maya had him dead to rights to get him down. Uh, but fought back up, uh, never got, you know, only got taken down, I think, once, sort of. Uh, got up, four separation, did some good grip fighting, won enough on the feet to win the fight. I, I mean, nobody looks good fighting Damian Maya. Uh, but, you know, Muhammad got a win, a win he needed. Good for him. Uh, I don't really know where Muhammad fits into the welterweight picture. He's... I just have a hard time figuring out where in that where in that division he's kind of fits because he's very good, but he's also very 
he's a little bit like the welterweight Marvin Vittori, if we're talking about his style of fighting, if you catch my meaning. He's got good he's got good power, but he likes going forward, making contact, getting the clinch, working from there, working his top game. Uh, which will find you a lot of success, but against the very elite, that's where it tends to struggle. So Jeff, you got anything? Any fond memories of Damian Maya as he exits the UFC? Not so much. It was a Damian Maya fight. Bilal Muhammad is ranked number it was eleven, I think. Number number twelve right now, 12. which I think is I think makes sense. He'll be in the top ten after this. Maya was he, nine. He fought smart. He stayed away from the grappling. He defended the grappling very well against Maya. And he did a good job. Uh, other than that, don't have much else to say about that fight. All right. Next up, kicking off the main card, Paul Craig, the Bear Jew, defeats Jamal Hill via TKO. And ugh. Did they did they maybe officially change that to a technical submission? I hope they did, because that's what it was, if nothing else. Paul Craig pulls guard, because that's what he does. Goes for the uh, the Frank Mir kind of shoulder and elbow lock on Hill's right arm. Hill defends, but can't really get free. Craig keeps the overhook. Lets Hill's left arm extend to kind of try for bicep control. First Rotates round TKO. Okay, I didn't know if they'd officially change or not. It's listed somewhat differently depending on where you are. The, anyway, he, spit- this is this is the official UFC email. It says, uh, oh, I have the scorecards here. Cra- Paul Craig won by TKO due to strikes okay. in round one. That's how they have it listed. Okay, well, which is fine. It's uh, just a load of crap, but I'll yell at the ref in a minute. <laughs> I got, I'll yell at the ref in a minute. I, this arm bar from Craig is a thing of beauty. He doesn't actually spin to the arm he has overhooked, which is what most people do. He feeds the other arm across his body to the arm that has the overhook. So he's got both arms trapped, technically. Spins under. Not only spins his hips for the arm bar, he pivots all the way using his shoulders. So he corkscrews Hill all the way to the ground. So they're both laying on their backs. And horribly dislocates Jamal Hill's elbow. Horribly. Uh, to the point where he's pushing on it, and there's no resistance. This thing's flopping around. He said it was like a it was like a a fish flopping around on his chest. He switches to a triangle, lands hammer fist and elbows, while the referee looks at this dangling appendage and goes, "Yeah, sure. Let's let's. Oh, what? I'm supposed to do something here? Oh, right. And finally, ugh, I can yell at the ref in a minute. Uh, fortunately, this was not a break. Again, this was uh, this was uh, updated to us during the card. This was a badly dislocated joint. They were able to uh, kind of uh, reset it. And thankfully, look, dislocations still suck, but they don't have quite this. And as long as there's no serious tendon damage or ligament damage, he should be more or less OK. Uh, mostly we're glad it's not a break, because if this was a break, that would have been that would have been a really bad break. So we'll you know we'll keep an update on Hill as far as that goes, but they popped it back into socket. Uh, he seems to be, and I'm sure there will be medical procedures, but seems to have avoided anything too serious as far as lingering injuries that we know of at the moment. A good win for Paul Craig. He was the underdog here. Not a lot of people at 205 pulling guard. Uh, Paul Craig's one of them, and you know, God bless him, he makes it work for him. Uh, Okay, so that's the fight. This ref. This was uh, Al Gaini. Gaini. Um, I don't watch as much regional MMA as I used to. I catch some on occasion. People who watch a lot more than I do, including uh, Sean Al Shadi, mentioned that Gaini is not a well-regarded referee. He tends to work more the local stuff in kind of the Arizona area. I understand the desire for a little bit of new faces in the referee's position. We can't have Herb Dean and Mark Goddard forever. And those two men are not infallible. I'm not saying, but they're them and Herzog and whatnot, kind of the, kind of the top of the food chain right now, right? Best referees we have not perfect, but 
no referee is. So I understand you might need to give referees without that same kind of exposure opportunities to do so. I would like to think that a commission would be self-aware enough to look at the history of that particular ref before making that decision. This man should not have been refereeing these kinds of fights, if his track record is any indicator. He missed not only a blatant fight-ending injury, but he missed Jamal Hill visibly pointing to it and going, my arm's screwed. This was a catastrophic failure by this particular referee, who does not exactly have a long history of competence to fall Hill back on. Hill was tapping out, right? Looked that way to me. Okay. He was at least motioning to the arm like, ref, look, my arm. Uh, which could certainly be construed as something akin to a tap, if nothing else. Uh, this this was a horrible officiating job. This should be studied as what not to do by referees. This man should not be licensed to referee again in the future. Certainly nothing of this caliber. And the Arizona Athletic Commission should have should do a little bit of soul searching about whatever thought processes and or procedures were in place that led to this outcome. Because apparently this was somewhat foreseeable and you guys should have done a better job. Shame on this ref and athletic commission, a little bit of shame on you too. So, but good win for Craig. He stopped uh, a guy with a lot of hype and did so in very emphatic fashion. Whatever else you want to say about it. You dislocate somebody's elbow, that's an emphatic win. Jeff? I mean, the referee what would have ruined what would have been an amazing submission stoppage for Paul Craig and potentially risked further, uh, further harm upon this young man, Jamal Hill's career, who was missing the tap. I mean, not only did he miss the submission, the tap out, but he he couldn't recognize that this guy's arm was was you know moving Maybe. every which way. Okay, so it wasn't broken, but it was clearly like out of its socket. It was at it like it, and when he had him in the arm bar, he was clearly visi- visibly motioning, tapping out. So it wasn't he missed that, and then. This referee has apparently a history of bad calls, according to Sean El Shadi. I mean, I have no reason to doubt Sean El Shadi on this uh, matter. And he let, and while that was happening, he let Hill take way more punishment than he needed to. The job of the referee is to protect the fighters. This is one of the biggest failures in that regard I've ever seen. Um, Al Guiney should have his license revoked. He should be banned from the sport. Yeah, I would I would not feel comfortable with that man refing my fight. For whatever that's worth. Uh, anyway, that was your main card. A uh, lot of fight time. This whole event, just for the record, clocked in at 7 hours and 24 minutes of total broadcast time, if my math off the top of my head is correct. And set a new record for total in cage fight time. Bring up the tweet very briefly because I have it bookmarked. I can find it. Um, yeah, I bookmarked it for this very specific reason. Oh, there it is. Different tab. Um, most record, so UFC 263 shatters the single event UFC record for most time, most fight time, with three hours, 19 minutes, and 32 seconds of total fight time. Previous holder was UFC 251 with three hours and seven minutes. And 27 seconds. He had 14 fights, three, three fights scheduled for five rounds, one which wasn't even a title fight, which... I don't even know how that was allowed, but I guess we can do that. It was now. a. I mean, there's no reason they can't, and I, and I don't mean that as some kind of like shot at anyone. The the three round non title fight thing is. I thought again, it was just for main events. 
That's a pol- that was a policy of the UFCs. That's not an athletic commission guide. Like, that's not every, a rule. Does that mean every fight can be five rounds now? Theoretically, yes. Wow. Let's do that for you, Robert. What do you think? You cut five fights out of every card, and I might accept <laughs> it. That, that's, not a, that's not a joke, by the way. If you cut down the total number of fights on a card by, again, five or six, but they're all five-round fights, I, think, I, might, I might be okay with that. I think we can just, just do record. that in general now. Just with, so we had uh, five fight prelims. Then we had uh, four, on, four on ESPN. And then five on, the main. And five on the main card, two title fights, and one five round uh, yeah. mid card, uh, main card fight. But it yeah. was uh, it was a long night. It was a long night. Anyway, as for the prelims, let's talk about these briefly. Um, Brad Riddell defeated Drew Dober via unanimous decision, 29-28 on across the boards. This was your fight of the night, deservedly so. This was a lot of fun. Brad Riddell's a legitimate guy to pay attention to i I don't know how far he's gonna go at lightweight lightweight being the division that it is but that man is a powerful striker he's a sophisticated striker his takedown defense is good he's good about getting up if you do get him down he's a handful um i think after the fight not in the not in his immediate post-fight interview but in some of the stuff he did after he was supposed to fight gregor gillespie a while ago that fight fell apart he would like to remake it I would like to see that fight still. That would be a great fight. Um, Drew Dober has a head like a fire hydrant. I'm borrowing a UFC line from that, but good grief. That man took punches and barely flinched. Uh, this was Again, this was your fight of the night. Look this one up if you haven't seen it. Eric Anders defeated Darren Stewart for unanimous decision. 29-28 and then two 29-27s. Eh, I don't have a whole lot here. This wasn't a bad fight, but it wasn't great. Women's flyweight, Lauren Murphy defeated Joanne Calderwood via split decision. These were 29-28s. I thought Calderwood won this fight. I don't know how you give Murphy the first round. I really don't. Um, Murphy should be the next title challenger to Valentina Shevchenko, and I look forward to Valentina turning that poor woman's face into hamburger meat, because that's what's going to happen. Uh, featherweight fight, Movsar Evoyev, this is one of the other fights I was looking forward to, defeated Hakeem Dawadu via unanimous decision, 29-27 on all three judges' scorecards. Uh, I think everyone gave Dawadu the third, which I'm not sure I did, but uh, Evoyev is a legitimate guy at featherweight. Um, he's undefeated. He's a smothering wrestler. He's got good striking, especially as far as setting up his wrestling goes. That man's a problem. I don't think I'm not saying future champion, but that man is a problem. As for the early prelims, Penny Kianzad defeated Alexis Davis via unanimous decision, 230-27 to 29-28. Uh, this was a giant meh. Lightweight, Terrence McKinney knocked out Matt Frivola in seven seconds with a beautiful one-two combination and then tweaked his knee celebrating. <laughs> because, of course, he did. Um, beautiful. Beautiful punches to finish the fight. I mean, that was great. Uh, and he didn't even do anything stupid celebrating. He didn't, like, backflip off the cage or anything. He just, like, draped his arms over the top and kind of hopped up and did the, you know, celebration. And then as he dropped down, just tweaked his knee a little bit, hopefully not seriously. Steven Peterson defeated Chase Hooper via unanimous decision, 2 30 one Chase Hooper should probably not be in the UFC. He's he's a very good grappler, and he's got a fairly good upside, especially for how young he is. But I I don't think his career is being done favors by being in the UFC at this point in time. Peterson missed weight for this fight, too, so for whatever that's worth. Uh, lightweight, Ferris Ziam defeated Luigi Vendramini via majority decision. 229-28, 128-28. I got to 28-28, but I don't object to not giving Vendramini a 10-8 third. Uh, Ziam's a very slick striker. Again, lightweight is kind of a shark tank, so who knows how far he'll go, but looked good for the first two rounds. And kicking everything off, Carlos Felipe defeated Jake Collier via split decision, 29-28. This was a heavyweight fight that was terrible. All right, Jeff, there were some good fights on the prelims. There were too many of them, but there were some decent fights. What sticks out to you? 
Uh, Terrence McKinney getting the seven second knockout over for Vola. Huh? It's pretty impressive. Ah, again, That's about it. You want to you want to know how to throw a good one two against the opposite stance fighter? Watch that sequence. He does it very very well. And was that McKinney's uh, UFC debut? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good that's a good way that'll get people talking about you, you know, after your UFC debut. Good for him. He had previously fought on the contender series and lost. I forget who he lost to. Someone who made it to the UFC, I can't remember. But he was on the contender series at one point. Okay. So if you count the contender, he had a fight on both. No, no, I, I don't count it as far as okay. being in the UFC. I just br- I just bring that up to mention he'd been kind of in the orbit. Mm. So again, yeah, UFC. He the, did fight the, eight. Di- he he fought eight days before. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he took this on short notice. This was supposed to be Frivola and uh, Frank Camacho, which would have been a crazy fight too. Good for so, that. Yeah. Good for that guy. Yeah. Oh, definitely. That guy's been up and down a lot uh, in his career, so I'm with you. Good for him. Anyway, that was UFC 263. It was an event, seemed to do pretty good traffic as far as uh, my coverage was concerned. So anyone who followed along live or has read it after the fact, thank you. If you haven't read it after the fact, it's in the MMA zone of 411mania.com. Go check it out. Uh, it's my, again, my live right. Ri- Play by play, round by round, doohickey. So I appreciate it uh, to everyone again during or after the fact. Many thanks to all of you. All right, but the gears keep turning. Uh, this weekend, UFC on ESPN 25. Probably not going to take a whole lot of time talking about this, but the main event is a very good fight. Dan Ige, who is fresh off of a win over, he knocked the stuffing out of Gavin Tucker, man. That was a 22 seconds. He smoked that man. Before that, lost a competitive five-round fight with Calvin Cater. That earned Calvin Cater a historic beatdown at the hands of Max Holloway. But Ige's a, he's only lost twice in the UFC. Again, one of those being to Cater. He's definitely on the up and up. Uh, and he's fighting the Korean zombie, Chan Sung Jung, former title challenger coming off of a loss to Brian Ortega. That was a... Decent-ish five-round fight in October of last year. Uh, this has a lot of potential to be a very entertaining fight. Uh, Jung is very rarely in boring fights. Ige is uh, the kind of guy who will fight him on the feet, who's good anywhere, but has a very slick jab. Uh, just Again, just a tough out, good striker. It ran a little bit into too much of a mirror in the Calvin Cater fight, and Cater's being a little bit better than him in the in what they chose to do. But Ige's a very, very legitimate fighter. Could crack further towards the top of featherweight with a win here. And frankly, I like his chances. Jung's always had a little bit of a hard time with guys more technical than he is. And he's not the same... His technique is a little bit slept on these days. But it's... I still think Ige is the more technical fighter, and I I, I like again I like Ige's chances, but this has a, this could be a really fun fight. Uh, Jeff, how do you see this one going? Kind of split on this one, just because like I like both guys, but <sighs> Korean Zombie he, he's a he's fun to watch, but he's he's disappointed me so much as well because. It seems whenever he's like sort of like right on the cusp of doing something great, he just gets sent crawling back, uh, or I guess he's in the last back second. down. He's in the last second of a fight. He's winning against Yair Rodriguez and gets hit with the craziest upward elbow you'll ever right. see. So I we I I almost kind of want to call him. A, he's not. He, he's like a high level gatekeeper basically i think um so this is a he's trending that way if nothing else uh this is a this is this is more of a test uh for dan ige to me and for zombie for korean zombie for for young it's it's a chance to prove he can beat like a tough a tough surging up-and-coming opponent um who has a pretty solid ufc record his only two losses are to Julio Ars, uh, sorry for mispronouncing it, 
and Calvin Cater. And uh, uh, Calvin Cater, I mean, that's that's a good loss in your resume to have, especially by decision. So he, he gave what, like 10 and two overall in the UFC, I think. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight and two. Eight and two. Okay. Ten overall. Eight, eight and two if you count the contender series win. Um, all right. So then te- then he would seven be and two. seven and two. Which is uh, really good. It's that's, still, uh, that's still good. Very good record either way. Um, so, yeah. How do I want? See, see, Korean Zombie's beatable. Mm-hmm. That's true. But this is this is going to be a five round main event. Has Ige fought for five rounds yet? Yeah, yes, the Kato fight was five rounds. This is a, so this is a second. So the you know, and they both lost their last five round fights. So. Uh, Uh, see, it's kind. This one's kind of a toss-up for me, Robert. But uh, yeah, it's, it's a good fight. It's a flip close a coin, one. On paper. Flip a coin. To me, this is like a pick 'em fight, basically. I think they're both very evenly matched. They both have. I think they both have their pros and cons. I'm gonna go with Korean Zombie just because of the experience level. Um, and, and if nothing else, man, Zombie hits hard. <laughs> like yeah, he does have a guy out, Yeah, I shoot. mean, he knocked out. He knocked out Frankie Edgar and, and Hanato Moicano. Those are both, even Frankie Edgar knocking him out in 2019. That's a good, you know, that's a good feather in your cap to have. And I, I mean, he, he lost the fight to Ortega, but he didn't get finished. So that, that counts for a little bit. So I'm going to go with Korean Zombie by decision. All right. I'm just, we're just going to do quick hits for the rest of this card. There, there's not, it's not that there's nothing. I'm not saying anything on the rest of this card is necessarily bad, but I don't think it deserves a tremendous amount of in-depth analysis. Uh, your co-main event at the moment, heavyweights Alexi Olenek and Sergey Spivak. I will sentimentally root for Olenek because he's he amuses me. And I don't mean that in a pejorative sense. I mean, his fights are always somewhat engaging to me. But logically, Spivak should probably take that. Uh, welterweight fight, Tim Means and Danny Roberts. It's not a terrible fight. What's Roberts been up to? I feel like he's been out for a while. Yeah, he hasn't fought since uh, November of 2019. But he kind of got lit up by Zalimia Madaev before landing. Uh, I mean, he won by knockout in the second, but end of the second. And he, I won't say lucky, but an atypical punch given how that fight was going. I'll pick Means there, but Means is getting long in the tooth, man. He's 37. He's had 45 fights. What is last two, though? Both of his last opponents missed weight. That poor man. I mean, he still beat him, so I'll go with Means. Bantamweight Marlon Vera and Davey Grant. That's not a... That's actually a solid... Nope. You gotta be like me to appreciate how good a fight that is, but that's a pretty good fight. Grant on a three-fight winning streak. The last two of those finishes... Those are some good finishes, too. And Vera um, lost to Jose Aldo. Uh, <clears throat> beat Sean O'Malley before that. What a long winning. Like That Aldo fight was his first loss at Bantamweight since 2018. I'll go with Vera. I, I mean, I won't be shocked if Grant wins, but Vera's better than you might think. Middleweight Wellington. Wellington Terman's back. Hey, good for him. Uh, I shouldn't say back. He got knocked out by Andrew Sanchez, though. Man, that guy's had a rough three-fight stint in the UFC. <sighs> Against Bruno Silva? I'll pick Terman, but yeah, that's iffy. Another welterweight fight, Matt Brown and Diego Lima. That could be fun. I'll pick Matt Brown. I mean, Lima's actually come on a little bit. I mean, he lost to Bilal Muhammad in his last fight, but had a three-fight winning. Bilal yeah. Muhammad's a tough out. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to pick Matt Brown, but Brown on a two-fight losing streak might be a bit set, overly sentimental on my part. Well, let's see. That's the main card as it currently stands. We have some fights that haven't been given a proper bout order yet. Prelims, 
Uh, Virna Jandiroba and was this always supposed to be this fight? Kanako Murata. Uh, Jandiroba is uh, she lost to Dern. She was streak. She was on a good run before that though. Jandiroba is a leg- pretty legitimate straw weight. Uh, Murata. I mean, where's this woman from? Uh, oh, she's from Japan. So her family name might be Kanako. We'll have to double check that. Um, she is 12 and one. Oh yeah, she she had a UFC debut November of last year. She's a fairly strong wrestler. Hmm. I'm gonna go with uh, I'm, I should go with Chandler but I'm gonna go with Kanako. I might regret that. Uh, featherweight Julian Arosa and Sung Woo Choi. Yeah, he had a rough first two fights. Jeez, he got matched up with Evloyev and Gavin Tucker. That's a that is a rough first couple of fights, man. Not too many people beat those guys. He's beaten Suman Mokhtarian and Yusuf Zalal since then. Whereas Arosa, didn't he like finally get a? Um, yeah, he's come back to the UFC and has two wins. I'm gonna pick Choi. Actually, I'm not a big believer in Arosa, but uh, we might be in for some fun there. Heavyweights, God help us. Josh Parisian and Roki Martinez. Um, Martinez, I guess, but uh, that's a terrible fight. Lightweight, Joachim Silva and Rick Glenn. Silva done. Silva got smoked by Nazrat Hakparast. Knocked out Jared Gordon, though. I'm, okay. I mean, Glenn's a tough fighter, but he's a he's a grinder, and he hasn't fought since November of 18. Jeez, what happened to him? I don't actually know. I'm going to assume injury with that kind of a layoff. Good grief. That's two and a half years, man. It's a long layoff. Yeah, I'm picking Silva. Women's flyweight, Casey O'Neill and Laura Procopio. Probably Procopio. Off the top of my head. Flyweight, this is a good fight, actually. Pay attention to this one. Tagir Ulanbekov and Tyson Nam. Ulanbekov's pretty legit. Uh, I think he's one and one in the UFC. Uh, Nam lost a split decision to Matt Schnell that shouldn't have been split. Um, I, I like Ulanbekov here, believe it or not. Uh, light heavyweight bite. Nikolai Negaroma. I've seen this, heard this gentleman's name pronounced. I'm going to butcher it. Uh, Nega Moreno and Alexa Kamer. Pro- believe it or not, I'm probably going to go with Nega Moreno. Uh, Nega, yeah, Nega Moreno. I forget where that guy's from. There might be a slightly different pronunciation on the end there. Anyway, Kamer's been kind of a bust in the UFC. He hasn't done a whole lot. And at welterweight, Chaos Williams and Matthew Semmelsberger. Uh, Williams... Lost his last fight, couldn't do a whole lot against Michelle Pereja, but that man brings the thunder. Uh, I, I like his chances against Semmelsberger. Uh, Semmelsberger is a very cerebral fighter, and cerebral fighters against guys with that kind of, those kinds of attributes that are difficult to intellectualize and plan around tend to struggle. Uh, all right, Jeff, that's the rest of our card. Anything stick out to you there? Anything you're looking forward to? Matt Brown versus Diego Lima, which should, you know, even coming off two fight losing streak, should probably be the co-main event for Matt Brown. Uh, you could have done that, and I wouldn't have hated it. Uh, it this well, is it's not a pandemic a... fight card. It's on ESPN two and ESPN plus. What are you gonna do? Yeah, there. Keep the machinery turning. You know, this is. Your main event's good, and as long if you've got that to at least kind of hang your hat on, then you've got something. Um, the rest of it, again, there's a few fights sprinkled throughout there, but we're kind of hoping this thing over. To, hang on. Wait, fighters wait. more than fighters more than the matchups that I'm interested in, but yeah. Seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Why? Are you, what are you doing to me, UFC, with these 14 fight cards? Why are you doing <laughs> this? Yeah, seriously. Why are you doing this, man? It's not necessary. Anyway, I will have coverage of that in the MMA Zona 411 Mania on Saturday, so please do stop by, say hello if you're so inclined. I appreciate it. 
All righty, let's move on then to some brief news, such as it was. I don't know if you saw this, Jeff, but women's multiple women's weight world women's world champion in boxing. She's a world champion in multiple weight classes. Olympic gold medalist Clarissa Shields made her pro MMA debut on at the PFL card this last week and had a rough go of it for the first couple of rounds before coming back to score the TKO win in the third. Uh, did you see it? Have you heard about Shields uh, making any noise in that respect? You got anything here? I have heard about it. I think this is a good prospect that PFL's managed to pick up. It's a good name uh, for them to promote, you know, PFL being what it is. Um, she's a young potential superstar. I disagree with Dave Meltzer that she is a superstar, but I think she has the tools to become one. Uh, good. You know, this is a good win for her. And um, we haven't seen too many like, you know, boxing champions like this make the transition to well, MMA. There have, there's yeah. a reason for that. And what is that? Well, most high level boxers are on the male side and male boxers at the high end make a lot more money than they would ever make in MMA. That's not well, as even, true. On even the, female, even female boxers. We haven't seen. Yeah. We haven't, we haven't seen a whole lot of it, which I'm, which is a little bit surprising because the market for women's boxing is just not that great. Right. Uh, I don't know. I'm not ascribing blame here. I'm just stating a fact. I don't know if the market just isn't there. I don't know if it's badly promoted. I don't know if they haven't had personalities. I don't know what mixture of those three, if there's some other factor I'm not aware of, whatever. But it's not quite there. There is a higher up end. There is a higher upper bound potential for financial earnings for female fighters in MMA than in boxing. Well, 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 look, uh, the potential's there for Brittany, uh, excuse me, for Cl Clarissa Shields after beating Brittany Elkin. So it's a good win, good start for her career. Um, if I'm PFL, I want to, you know, I do want to carefully match her up for her future matchup. Take take that slow. There's no yeah, rush take it, Yeah, take it slow with her because, I mean, she is 26 and, and we'll see what happens with her in the future. But uh, it is, you know, apparently she trains at uh, Jackson Wink. Mm-hmm. Um, so she has a good camp behind her, so we'll see what she does. Yeah, she's, she's still very green. There's a few things that need to be addressed there. She, to her credit, tremendous poise. She got mounted a few different times in this fight and she never panicked and her passing defense isn't great. Her takedown defense is okay, but you never lost your cool and never broke mentally. A lot of people in that position, by the time you come out for that third round, might be beaten more mentally than physically. She had you know, had tremendous grit, uh, great hand speed, which is not a surprise. She's not the biggest puncher in the world, but uh, she can put together enough volume to give you problems. So there's a lot of upside there. To any of the people saying we need to see her against um, Kayla Harrison, no, I don't need that. Mm, you don't need that. Not right now. Clarissa Shields doesn't need that. Kayla Harrison comes from a combat sports background better suited to mixed yeah. martial arts than Shields. I mean, here's the other thing about it. Kayla Harrison is the most decorated judoka in American history. Like, full stop. The closest, uh, the closest the men's side has ever gotten to success at the Olympic level is silver. And God bless Travis Stevens for pulling that off, by the way. Uh, his Travis Stevens is a fascinating grappling pros, uh, character to watch, but not only is Kayla Harrison an Olympic gold medalist, she's a world champion and she's a, she's a back-to-back -back Olympic gold medalist and an undefeated wanted, MMA fighter. And yeah, under uh, she, her last couple of fights, man, she turned her opponents into victims at a horror movie. Took like, the gold fight, at world at the world judo and the Pan Am games. And if you've ever seen her in person, that woman is huge. Like she fights at 150. She can make 145, but it takes uh, it takes a specific effort. Like it's doable, but not on short notice. That woman is yoked. She is a physical specimen. Uh, 
Clarissa Shields doesn't need that yeah, right that's now. Ri- yeah, that's ridiculous. That'd be ridiculous. So ridiculous. Uh, Harrison's probably going to find a way to the UFC if UFC keeps featherweight around in any kind of capacity. Like, she's that good. Uh, and Shields might get there, but let's not ru- let's yeah, not. Yeah, don't rush, rush her along. You got like um. Bellator, I think, made the mistake of rushing that really good uh, wrestler. Was it uh, Aaron? P- I want to say Aaron Pico. Aaron P- yeah. Who actually Pico got a pretty good win at, uh, at the Bellator event this last week. Okay. Too. They, but, but they, yeah. they, 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 they put him in matchups he was not ready for. Yeah, for sure. Uh, look, you can't do that. You can't pull like soccer moms out of the stands to fight Clarissa Shields. Right. But she does not need to be fighting legitimate top end talent exactly exactly i agree but good for uh, you know good for good for her and good for pfl for finding some good prospects like this pfl is having its most interesting season ever uh, so i, I want to give a brief shout out to them they they're putting together some good cards and they have maybe the best commentary booth in mma right now so i uh, will give them a little bit of a shout out we mentioned bellator briefly um Again, the big thing, uh, Yaroslav Amosov defeated Douglas Lima to become the, Bel- the Bellator welterweight champion. Amosov is undefeated. He's like 26-0, and 0, I think. Um, that man's a problem at welterweight. Uh, I'm not saying I'd pick him to beat you know, Kamaru Usman or anything, but it, he would fit right into the top of the UFC. That man is, he is a physical, he is a force. He is not to be trifled with. So good for him. Uh, definitely look forward to his future. Um, was there anything else that came out of that Bellator card? Not really. So anyway, a little bit of news from around the MMA world there. All right, last news bit I have, then I'm going to check Twitter and see if anything crazy has happened. Um, the, I talked about this last week a little bit, the boxing exhibition between Floyd Mayweather and Logan Paul. Took place last Sunday. And apparently did over a million pay-per-view buys. Jeff? Yeah, no kidding. (laughs) You have Floyd Mayweather, who, you know, who could probably poop in a a dish on pay-per-view, and it would probably do a million buys. Uh Floyd had the best line about this whole about this event in the lead up. He said, This is just legalized bank robbery for me, man. I get twenty million dollars to show up and be I don't know exactly what he made. I'm, Twenty million might be a significant exaggeration, but Floyd doesn't fight cheap, and stupid, I, stupid. I, I know Logan Paul made about twenty million. I think that's been disclosed. Was this a trailer fight? No, this was on Showtime. I think. Still stupid. Ah, uh, yeah, it's, it is. You know, but... and you know it's stupid. Of course it's stupid. I watched it. I did a watch along with Mark for this thing. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it was stupid. Uh, but it was stupider than than Spiral from the Book of Saw. Yeah, that's a pretty stupid movie. Uh, actually, is it? Maybe Hang Floyd on, Mayweather but... will fight the brother. He may all fight Jake Paul next. How about that? After time. He might. Public. Uh, after Jake beats Tyron Woodley, he might. And for the record, that is my off off the cuff. That is actually my pick. I kind of think Jake's going to beat Tyron. And Jake Paul continues to make stupid amounts of money beating up washed MMA fighters. <laughs> oh, that's going to be... That's going to be something. But, you know, Jake actually wants to be taken a bit more seriously as a fighter than Logan does. So who knows? Um, well, that was an exhibition fight. So it, it was technically not a real fight. Well, doesn't count towards a professional record. Uh, yes. And, and yeah, again, look, you know what? I, I have to take my hats off my hat off to those guys for getting a stupid amount of money. I don't. Dude, I wish I was in a position to I make that kind on of the money hat for that. I spit on the hat, and I step on the hat. I, I have to respect the hustle. I just do. 
I know how hard it is to do what Floyd did to get where to get to the point where he is. And believe it or not, I uh, I know a bit about how difficult it is to do what Lo- what the Paul brothers do. It's a lot of effort, and you might find them distasteful characters. I'm not going to in any way try to convince you out of that. I don't know that I could. I don't know that I'd want to. But what they do... Like garbage, scam people out of their money, abuse women, video... Uh, again, go to, go, to, go to a Japanese... Uh, 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 take, take video of, uh, of, a, of, a, of a place where people committed suicide and, and take video of it, get banned from YouTube. Yeah, I'm sure that looks, takes a lot of effort. Hang on. That's their, you're talking about character at that point. And again, I'm not talking about character. I, I would never convince anyone about their character, and I wouldn't try to. I don't have a very high opinion of their character. Okay. But what they do is wake up, film for seven hours, edit video for three hours every day. I doubt they're editing the video at this point. They have a hand in it because they they need to oversee it. Mm. What And look, again, I'm not saying like them. Don't. But what they do, being successful at YouTube is hard, is incredibly sure. difficult. Sure. And their sustained success at that. But is I not don't an respect accident. it. But I don't respect it. All right. That's fine. I mean, I, I can't make you respect hard work. <laughs> and, and let me be clear. That's all I respect about them. All right. But, but what they do is hard work. And I have to, and I do have to at, at least acknowledge that. I don't respect. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to say. Any, I'm not going to say anything. I'm done. I've look, said look, what I. I've okay. said my piece. Again, dislike them personally. Wish their success on people better and more deserving. Cool. Fine. I don't disagree with that one iota. Okay. Not one iota. <laughs> but they are not. They are neither lazy, nor as stupid as they would have you believe. Is do you believe Tyron Woodley is getting paid more for the Jake Paul yes. fight than his UFC career? Yes. Even even then when he was champion. The highest disclosed payday that Tyron Woodley ever made was part as part of UFC 205 when he made three million dollars. Was that with pay per view or without? Yes, with. That was with okay. the pay per view points provided by Conor McGregor being on that card. Okay, so I I. Uh, somebody. So he's getting uh, paid more. He's getting paid more for Jake Paul. You think? He is guaranteed. He was guaranteed. Ben Askren. Ben Askren did not get paid more than he. I. Ben Askren got 500k flat. Ben Askren probably. Ben Askren A probably had pay-per-view points and B. I have no. Let me let me put it. Let me put it this way about Ben Askren. I have. N- I have no doubt he was contracted to make more for that one fight than his three fights in the UFC. Whether or not Triller actually ponies up is an entirely different subject. Showtime will pay what they're what is contractually owed. Uh, Tyron is. Uh, uh, this is from. Hang on. Let, let me let me see if I can find the tweet. Um, because John Nash read because Dana White went off a little bit about this called Tyron yeah, Woodley he, washed liar. And uh, John Nash. Um, John, Woodley yeah. fought on a John Jones card too when he was champion when he lost to Usman. Um, so hang on. So Nash, I believe, reached out to uh, some of the representation. Yeah, here it is. I have the tweet. So Woodley's claiming it's the highest purse of his career. His guarantee is somewhere between one and one point five million, where and has an upside for so pay per view points that could easily that could probably surpass the three million for two oh five. Again, Dana can sit, Dana called Woodley. All right, a 40 but that's based on, but that's based on the pay-per-view buys. Well, again, the look, the ups, even if you wanted to remove the upside, if we just take guaranteed purse versus guaranteed purse, he's guaranteed at least twice what he made for UFC 205. He made 500 K Woodley made 500 K on his contract for the UFC 205. Is, he's that, guaran- is that Woodley saying that or his management? That's disclosed. Mm. That is, that was his disclosure. I don't his believe it. I don't believe no, it. No, no, hang on, hang on. I, look, when you factor in the pay-per-view points for UFC 205, Woodley made about three million dollars. His show and win bonus setup, he made 500k. 
That's what Tyron Woodley made for UFC 205 from his UFC contract show and win setup. Okay. Now, again, total, he made more. But contract, what he was contracted for, I believe, was either 500K flat or 250 and 250. That was his setup. He's guaranteed a million dollars from Showtime for that for this fight. Guaranteed. Upside being more. Again, Dana's quote was Woodley's 40 years old and hasn't won wait, a fight Woodley, in three wait, years. Woodley is yes. guaranteed? Wait, so Woodley Showtime is, guaranteed. is wait, Showtime is promoting this fight? Yes. So it's not Triller. Uh, I'd still want to see the actual, I'd still want to see some actual figures. Well, again, the fight hasn't happened yet, but this is from Woodley's management. So again, for whatever you want to trust. Yeah, I don't trust the management then. Well, it's, uh, sorry, from his, his attorney, not his manager. Okay. And which is important because the legal. I trust his attorney even less. I'd trust the attorney more, but the attorney's response. So again, the, the exchange went. Dana White called Tyron Woodley 40 year old, a 40-year-old who hasn't won a fight in three years and is lying about his paycheck. The response the first from... The to that are technically true. Woodley is not 40 years old. He's 39. He's almost 40. Yeah, sure, but he's... But, uh, so this is from Sam Spira, who is Woodley, uh, Tyron Woodley's attorney who helped craft his fight agreement for Showtime. Tyron's only 39, same age as Roger Federer who is still a very, very competitive high-level tennis player. And Tyron is not lying about his payout. I have no problem believing that Tyron Woodley will probably make more for this fight with Jake Paul than he did for his highest ever payday in the UFC. That not one bit surprises me. Not one. Yeah, but he's only in this position because he's a former UFC champion and former UFC fighter. Okay, but how does that what, what that's true, but I'm asking what that adds to the point. Mm, I, 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 I trying to be like, oh, we're going to actually pay these guys what they deserve. It, it's it's all a bunch of go- it's gobbledygook. I'm sorry. Well, it, I mean, it is and it isn't. The UFC's the UFC's division of uh, revenue is established at this point via court documents. We know what they okay. pay, and it's significantly less than every other major sporting organization. Okay, that's not a law. That's not a law. No, uh, look, I'm not. A, let me be clear. Unless I'm we not need, a, unless we need, like, a, unless you want to make a law, like, like the revenue split has to be this and this. There's I'm, no, you know, there's I no law. Not, it's not. I'm, there's I'm not no law determining. I'm not accusing the UFC of any illegality at all. They are they are well within the they are well within the letter of the law here. So basically, 100%. they know how to run a pro. You're basically telling me the UFC knows how to run a profitable business is basically what you're telling me. I'm and telling- that's how they're they're one of the few game you know games in the business who knows how how to run their business properly and with longevity to continue paying fighters and not going under is basically what you're saying. I'm telling you the UFC has found a wonderful way to exploit their labor force. Okay. Like every other business out there. Sort of. Okay. I rest my case. Well, again. Um, the prime, there are differences in specific detail. Look, again, I, UFC is absolutely going to try and pay the lowest amount they possibly can for the best product. Their business so if the fighters they, want more than unionize and get them to change it. It's that simple. Yeah. The, yeah. Again, the only way this is going to change fighters on the off chance, any of you are listening, there's only two ways the UFC will change. This is it. Only two. You are not special. Connor isn't even the, whoever has made the most money in UFC history, probably Connor has not been paid what he's what he has brought into the company in revenue. I guarantee it. Because we know what the UFC does. They pay less than 20% annual revenue to the fighters. You okay. want to change that, you need a collective bargaining agreement or you need law or you need congressional law. Like okay. that's it. 
Okay, sadly, I have to run now, Robert. Uh, so well, we can wrap just things up now. Yeah, yeah, give me just a sec. Let me have a look through Twitter. I don't think anything has broken in the MMA or combat sports face. Uh, not really. All right. Jeff, you have a new podcast that you're a part of that's launched since the last time you were here. So where can the people find you? The 411 Wrestling Interviews podcast on uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play. And you can also uh, check out my reviews of Loki, A Fast Nine, The Fast Saga, and uh, some Ghostbusters stuff uh, over on movies uh, and TV. And also uh, check out my news in other zones uh but my 411 wrestling interviews podcast yeah thank you guys oh you don't want to pimp your other podcast okay well um uh i co-host uh this week in wrestling with that's more mike sandoval's uh thing i guessed on uh this week in wrestling uh which you uh can also find on youtube on muse tv yeah so support jeff wherever he happens to be in the world um speaking of jeff and i doing podcasts believe it or not uh when I, as i get into my plugs an old podcast series i used to host called everyone loves a bad guy is getting some syndicated re-airs because we did not want it just lost to the ether of the internet and this week well sorry next sunday the 20th in honor uh, to kind of coincide with the release of pixar's luca um re we are re-releasing the episode that jeff and i did on pixar villains so you can look forward to that if you're so inclined. You can find me covering professional wrestling on occasion. Mondays, I cover AEW's Dark Elevation. Wednesdays, whatever MLW is up to as they get ready for their relaunch. And WWE uh, Friday Night Smackdown on Fridays. If you want to come by, watch me kill traffic to the website. I am the death of, <laughs> I am the death of interest. Uh, that's, that's what I do. And Sunday or Saturday, of course, UFC on ESP, UFC on ESPN 25, not 9, 25. And we'll be back here next week to review UFC on ESPN 25 and preview to do UFC on ESPN plus 48. That is a card. That is, uh, yeesh. Okay, that's not a bad card. That's not a sexy card, but that's not a bad card. Your main event for that fight is Cyril Gaon and Alexander Volkov. So a heavyweight contender will potentially emerge, depending on how the heavyweight division shakes out. That's, uh, well, there are some dogs on that card, too, now that I'm looking at it. Good Lord. No one wants to see Ed Herman and Danilo Marquez. Just why? Anyway, I'll be back here for that. And do I have anything else this week? See, last week I was part of a Metal Hammer of Doom episode looking at Dr. Colossus, the stoner metal group, with their Simpsons-themed album, I'm a Stupid Moron with, a, with an Ugly Face and a Big Butt, and My Butt Stinks, and I Like to Kiss My Own Butt because they had to go through the whole Moses Lack quote. Uh, again, last week I was also, I did a live watch-along for Logan, uh, Logan Paul and Floyd Mayweather. This week, I do not have any damn you hollywoods Let's see no that's a rear nope uh so yeah back next week uh for again the review preview and i will have more i will uh, have other stuff to <laughs> to pimp out next week but that's my plugs for the week thank you all very much for all of your likes comments subscriptions all the feedback all the shares all the support that you give the podcast Many, many thanks to all of you. Until next time, I'm Robert. That's Jeff Harris. Stay safe out there, and please remember to be well, be safe, and behave.